By September 1950, General Douglas MacArthur had totally reversed the situation in Korea. After a brilliant counterattack that had retaken all of the South, American and UN troops were able to relax, at least for a brief moment, before resuming the campaign. I think there is very much a sense within commanders in the field that this thing's gonna be over. We're gonna be able to go up there and we're gonna take care of this situation. The North Koreans, they're wiped out. When MacArthur led the UN command forces, he was quite confident that the Chinese would not respond. His reasoning was that it would have been impossible for the Chinese side to both fight the Americans and successfully conquer Taiwan. And he concluded that they would not sacrifice the unification of the country for a military action in the Korean Peninsula. It was a reasonable calculation, but it was completely wrong. As we saw in our last episode, General Douglas MacArthur emerged as a hero after the historic landing at Incheon and his successful campaign to drive North Korean forces above the 38th parallel. It was a high point for American leadership and vindication for the U.S. military. But the prospect of a U.N. victory forced political recalculation in Moscow, Beijing, and in Washington, D.C. In the fall of 1950, superior American firepower on the ground and dominance in the skies forced a North Korean retreat. At home, President Truman and the Democratic Party were just months away from a midterm election. The loss of China and Truman's early handling of Korea had already become major campaign issues. Good news from Korea would help bolster Democratic chances at the polls. Truman needed voters to see him as committed to countering Soviet and Chinese aggression. The cause of freedom is being challenged throughout the world today by the forces of imperialistic communism. This is a struggle above all else for the minds of men. Adding to Truman's political calculation were a host of domestic challenges. Harry Truman had some of the worst poll ratings in American history. At one time, he was down to 26%. Of course, inflation was going crazy before the Korean War. They referred to him as horse meat Harry because people were having to substitute horse meat for hamburger. And he was exposed as having all sorts of communists in his administration. This had been going on for a couple of years. So Truman had a lot of domestic problems. Of course, the Republicans were all too happy to pounce on him as the media today likes to say whenever Republicans do something, Republicans pounce. And, and so they pounced on Truman over the domestic problems. The president clearly needed a boost. With events in Korea now trending in the direction of the US, Truman turned to his most prominent and popular military officer. The president requested an audience with the general. The meeting was basically after the glory of Incheon. Nobody had thought it would work to come off as successfully it did because it basically trapped that North Korean army. The 8th Army broke out of that Pusan perimeter. It was the hammer against the anvil. All of a sudden, the North Korean army is streaming north. MacArthur is being called the Sorcerer of Incheon. And now Truman's getting ginned up. He's going to get the United Nations to come together and go for rolling into North Korea, uniting the country, holding free elections. That's the new impetus. And it's also an election year, November's coming up, and Truman wants to be seen with the commander. Truman wanted him to come back to Washington, and MacArthur said he couldn't leave the theater. Truman insisted on an in-person meeting. MacArthur finally acquiesced, but only at a location within a half day's travel of his Tokyo headquarters. Truman agreed, although it meant flying more than 14,000 miles to conference with the subordinate he ruefully called 
God's right-hand man. MacArthur is a now five-star general, and you go back to Truman's military experience as an artillery captain in World War I, I think MacArthur looked at President Truman with disdain as just he's a, a captain, and I think he had that in his mind. But I think in MacArthur's mind, he still held the, the high cards because of his reputation, because he had defended South Korea. Perhaps surprisingly, the two men had never actually met face to face. This would be their first in-person encounter. I think MacArthur knows what's up. Truman had asked him to come to Hawaii. MacArthur says, no, I'm not going that far. They decide on, on going to Wake Island. Both of them have staffs that surround them that just berate the other guy nonstop. So when you get to Wake Island, it's the first meeting between them. On his way to his historic meeting with General MacArthur, President Truman arrives at Hickam Field, Hawaii. Truman wanted to appear both tough on communism and open to the possibility of peace. And like many of his advisors, he worried that China or Russia might join the fight directly. The president expresses optimism for peace. I'm not one of those who thinks that another world war is inevitable. I'm just as sure as I stand here that the people behind the Iron Curtain are just as anxious for peace as I am. Now, right before this meeting, the Truman administration had advanced a memo in which they were going to try to call for a negotiated ceasefire and pull back along the 38th parallel. And MacArthur learned of it. He leaked information to his allies in Congress and said basically that MacArthur and the Chinese leader needed to personally meet to iron this out. MacArthur's a general. He's not the head of state. So once again, he undermined Truman's own diplomatic and military agenda and set up one of his own that was way out of his lane. With the election now less than a month away, the two men finally met on October 15th on Wake Island, some 2,300 miles west of Honolulu. Instead of a military salute, MacArthur greeted the president with a handshake, breaking protocol and setting the tone for the meeting to follow. At the Wake Island conference, MacArthur's there at the bottom of the stairs when Truman you know, deplanes. MacArthur is walking towards Truman, and it's not this full salute here. The footage is him coming out with his hand like this, coming out to shake hands with the president, not giving him that respect of you're the commander in chief. And Truman picks up on that. You know, Truman lets it slide, but he's gonna, he's gonna be pretty irked about it. He showed Truman the most disrespect you could probably show to almost any American president. When it looked like Truman was going to rein him in and keep him from moving on into China. He made the prophecy to some of his minions in Congress that if we didn't stop the Chinese, if we didn't invade China, we would be looking at, quote, losing Europe. He tied together Europe and China. So um, he very much thought that Truman needed to be told, you know, which way to butter his bread. MacArthur assured the president that the fighting was nearly over. China would not enter the war, and if they did, he would annihilate them. The meeting lasted only 90 minutes. Afterward, Truman presented MacArthur with the Army Distinguished Service Medal, the fifth time the general had received the award. On the tarmac before starting the long flight back to Washington, the president told reporters, quote, I've never had a more satisfactory conference since I've been president. He always viewed MacArthur as something of a prima donna and somebody who had to be managed. But he also knew that MacArthur knew his way around a battlefield. He didn't want to lose him if possible, but he couldn't have him constantly going off making comments about invading China, which is completely contrary to the administration's position. For his part, MacArthur returned to Tokyo in a rage. Who was that whippersnapper who kept asking questions, he demanded of his staff, who determined it was the Assistant Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, the same man who had, just a few years earlier, 
chosen the 38th parallel as the dividing line in Korea. Later, MacArthur would write, quote, That conference made me realize that a curious and sinister change was taking place in Washington. The defiant, rallying figure that had been Franklin Roosevelt was gone. Instead, there was a tendency toward temporizing rather than fighting it through. MacArthur was very upset at being having to do this. He called it a publicity stunt. He said, I've got to go halfway across the, you know, the Pacific during this war that we're in, you know, to, to be given a photo op with the president. Later on in life, he'll say, you know, that he, he really had a lot of guts. Um, but I, I don't think, you know, he has much of any respect for him at all at, the, at that point at Wake Island. Within days of the Wake Island meeting, with the blessing of the president, South Korean and U.S. troops rolled into the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. As U.S. infantrymen reach the heart of the city, the Reds are withdrawing. The main Red force has begun to flee northward in disorganization. MacArthur's orders were to do what he deemed necessary to secure the entire peninsula. It was all going according to plan. Battle of Korea draws to a close. Pyongyang, the red capital, lies in United Nations hands. That's Pyongyang below. Its capture is an inspiring and historic birthday present to the United Nations, 53 of whose 60 member nations supported the military campaign. The feeling was, war's over, boys will be home by Christmas, we can say goodbye to this war. At home, the threat of the Chinese was not sufficiently brought out to the American people. We're risking a war with a nation of a billion plus people on their home territory. Anything to do with a land war in China is the wrong war in the wrong place in the wrong time. As our country faces important challenges at home and abroad, the new 82nd Congress convenes. At home, the good news from Korea helped keep Democrats in charge of both houses of Congress. But the Republicans gained 28 seats in the House and six in the Senate, narrowing the Democratic majority. Republicans now lead a party which has cut the Democratic Senate majority to only two votes. With Pyongyang now under UN control, MacArthur moved troops north to the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and China. Hoping to increase the tempo of attack, he ordered American soldiers to the front, a change in the policy of always keeping South Koreans in the lead. A new threat to the Reds gets underway. There are over 4,000 men in this operation, which consists of two separate drops. Heavy equipment was parachuted in to support the advancing UN Army, including jeeps, howitzers, and ammunition. Watching the jump is General MacArthur. Flying over the attack area, the United Nations commander stated, this closes the trap on the enemy. More troops and supplies arrived by sea in what many believed would be the final operation of the war. The success of Inchon led MacArthur to plan another landing, and that's on the east coast in Wonsan. And so as the 8th Army attacked north in the west toward Pyongyang, they landed the 7th Infantry Division and the Marines in Wonsan and attacked north. And of course, that is problematic because it divided U.S. forces by the Taebaek Mountains. But even as the U.N. ratcheted up pressure on the north, signs were emerging that the war might take an unexpected turn. Some enemy combatants captured in the offensive wore the uniform of the Communist Chinese Army. Chairman Mao was sending a warning. He was prepared to defend Chinese territory against even as powerful an adversary as the United States. The Chinese, through the Chinese embassy in India, tried to inform the United States, look, if you come too close, we're going to defend ourselves. MacArthur's arrogance worked well when it came to the Inchon landing, but it was catastrophic when it came to the ground war in the north. He heard reports uh, that Chinese prisoners were being captured. You know, these guys are Chinese. They're not North Korean, they're Chinese. But he said, nah, besides, 
What does it matter? You know, Chinese aren't going to dare fight us. So he was wildly overconfident in his ability to fight against Chinese forces and to deter them from entering just by the sheer power of you know, forces under his control. MacArthur's forces reached the northern border of Korea at the end of October when they first encountered Chinese forces in massed formation. Led forward with a bugle call, waves of red Chinese soldiers overwhelmed scattered UN units, then melted back into the countryside, making no attempt to hold any of the ground they took. When the Chinese come in, they're not an overly equipped army. No tanks, no trucks, very little artillery. They didn't have any firepower. These guys all on foot, it's freezing. They're all undernourished, malnourished, and you take a week of fighting and they had to withdraw because uh, they were totally wiped out. MacArthur pressed on, convinced sporadic engagement with Chinese troops did not foreshadow a large scale Red Army attack. When Thanksgiving arrived, American troops close to Korea's northern border, some within eyesight of Chinese territory, were offered a holiday respite. There's been hard fighting. Thanksgiving is something that we all experience, you know, a common American holiday. And to this day, you will see in military units that senior officers will go to the mess hall and they will serve their troops on Thanksgiving. That's a, a long time custom that exists in our, our military. But it also does show that our superior logistical capability to be able to feed the troops on that scale in dispersed locations. Of course, some had better, better food than others, but to try to bring that sense of home and use our superior logistics capability to take care of our troops. Victory seemed assured. That was talk of war's end by Christmas. What the Americans didn't know was that some 260,000 Chinese troops had already managed to cross the Yalu River in preparation for a major offensive. It was a massive intelligence failure on the part of MacArthur and his staff. Estimates of Chinese strength at the border were less than one-tenth of what was really there. Further, the Americans had misjudged the will of Mao Zedong. Mao decided against the wishes of the rest of the leadership that China must send forces to Korea, partly to uh, protect its border. That's very understandable, very ordinary reason, as UN forces were moving rapidly up to the Chinese border and MacArthur was talking about crossing the border into China. But also, because from Mao's point of view, as crazy as this sounds, the revolution in China would get weak following the establishment of the People's Republic. They're no longer fighting, right? They're no longer fighting against Chinese nationalists, fighting against the Japanese. He was afraid that revolutionary spirit would flag, right? Therefore, in Mao's mind, as a true revolutionary, the best thing for the Chinese revolution would be to fight against the world's most powerful armed forces. <laughs> if you're a real revolutionary, you think that way. Before MacArthur could complete his endgame, American troops came under a second and sustained counterattack by Chinese forces. What the Chinese did, I mean, they were a guerrilla army after all. They had fought Japan, right? <laughs> Very powerful military force. They were very skilled as guerrilla fighters. They took up positions high up in the mountains. In the daytime, planes take over, pinning the enemy to the hills. The UN forces were mechanized, which meant they were road bound. And as they moved rapidly toward the Chinese border along roads, they naturally got kind of strung out. And so the Chinese waited until there was a group of UN forces a little bit separated, right, from those in front and behind. Then at night, they would come down 
from the mountains in very large numbers. Uh, surprise attacks surround them. These hand-to-hand -hand combat get control of their artillery pieces. It was terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Um, and it, it was effective, it worked. On November 27th, Chinese forces surprised U.S. troops under the command of General Oliver P. Smith, deployed by the Chosin Reservoir, a man-made lake in northeast Korea, close to the Chinese border. Communist Chinese hordes by the hundreds of thousands from the Manchurian border force immediate evacuation by United Nations troops who continue their retreat. These Marines will form new lines to make another stand. But for their buddies trapped in the Chosin Reservoir area, it is a grim fight for survival. 120,000 Chinese regulars participated in the attack against some 30,000 UN troops. The ensuing battle was among the most brutal of the entire war. On top of the Chinese assault, a cold front blew in from Siberia. Temperatures dropped to as low as negative 36 degrees Fahrenheit. Frostbite was rampant. Rifles refused to fire. Oil in trucks and jeeps turned to glue. The cold was as much of an enemy as the Chinese or the North Koreans were. And that was the problem. They were building campfires right up on the front line the night that the Chinese attacked because it was so cold. And that's going to be a big problem getting out. But it also helps a lot because a lot of those guys that get shot, their blood coagulates, it freezes, and it saves a lot of them. I think they fly out about a thousand casualties from an airport they built basically overnight there. The television series MASH portrays a fictional version of a mobile army surgical hospital during the Korean War. But the real thing did exist. Helicopters allowed for quick evacuation of wounded soldiers. MASH units were located close to the front lines, designed to be disassembled and moved on just six hours notice. They could be operational within four hours of arrival at a new site. The ability for medical care had really taken monstrous strides in World War II. And when Korea comes along, it keeps the casualties down to practically minimal. You would have lost most of those wounded people back in World War I or, you know, back to the Spanish-American War. All of them probably would have gone. But the ability for the medical facilities to be able to cope with all the casualties that are coming in, that's probably one of the great miracles of the Korean War. It continued on through Vietnam and, and still to this day, it's probably one of the greatest assets the United States military has built over the years is the medical corps. Within days of the Chinese attack, UN forces were in full retreat. General O.P. Smith tried to put a positive spin on the decision to withdraw, telling reporters on December 4th, gentlemen, we are not retreating. We are merely advancing in another direction. Over 10 days, UN forces fought their way 70 miles to the seaport of Hamnam on Korea's east coast. Along the way, Korean refugees choked the roadways, voting with their feet and giving up their homes to escape communist rule. One hundred thousand men and their equipment were loaded onto waiting ships. Upwards of 95,000 refugees were evacuated as well. Before the last ships sailed to the safety of Pusan, Troops destroyed the vast cache of arms, supplies, and equipment they were forced to leave behind. Then the port itself was systematically blown apart. During the Chosin campaign alone, the Marines lost 4,400 casualties in battle, another 7,300 to frostbite. China suffered some 37,500 losses, many of these to the cold. What you can say about the Marines is those Chinese armies that came against them, you didn't see them for another year because the Marines just handed it to them. I mean, it's it's probably the greatest episode in you know US military history, but it is Mao's victory, no doubt about it. <laughs> 
The main thing he wanted to do was to destroy a U.S. Marine division. He did not care if it brought on World War III, and he didn't care if he lost all those men to frostbite and to malnutrition, but the Chinese can't keep up the pressure because they're all on foot, they're all frozen, they're all starving, and so this is a big problem for them. The UN retreat from Northern Korea put gains below the 38th parallel in jeopardy as well. Douglas MacArthur reached out to another veteran of the Second World War, General Matthew Ridgway, to take on the ground command of U.S. forces in Seoul. The Eighth Army is yours, he told Ridgway. Do what you think best. The Americans are now in a fix because now they've got to decide what they want to do. Do they want to get heavily into this war or do they want to pull out and go back to status quo Annabelle? The once proud capital city of Seoul is soon to be occupied by the enemy. On January 4th, the southern capital was captured by the Chinese. It was another low point for the U.S. military. The victory that once seemed all but assured was now slipping away. America had one ace left. And to some, playing the nuclear card seemed the only way to regain the initiative. 1951 would prove the bloodiest year for U.S. forces fighting in Korea. More than 12,000 Americans died in that year alone, and 70,000 more were wounded. With the entrance of China into the war and the withdrawal of U.N. troops from North Korea, President Truman now faced a major decision. Would the U.S. and the United Nations continue the fight? And if so, how far was he willing to go to win? That's next time on the Unauthorized History of the Korean War.